Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والعدوان إلا على الظالمين والعاقبة للمتقين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على عبدك ورسولك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا إن شاء الله تعالى I wanted to continue connecting some of what we are seeing in غزة with our brothers and sisters may Allah سبحانه وتعالى grant them victory اللهم آمين and some of the episodes of the سيرة and some of the framings that we find in the Quran and the سنة that otherwise might have felt distant from us. And SubhanAllah, every single week, there is another section of the Qur'an and the Sunnah that's given life through one of the tragedies that unfolds with our brothers and sisters in Gaza. And so tonight I actually wanted to talk about al jur hunger. And SubhanAllah, this is a topic that you usually hear in one of two settings. You either hear about it in Ramadan, when we talk about how our exercise of fasting is to, in some ways, one of the benefits of it, feel the pain of hunger and then connect to our brothers and sisters who do not have food on a regular basis. And you hear it in a fundraiser, talking about one of our beloved populations, whether it is our brothers and sisters in Yemen or Somalia or Sudan or Syria, wherever it may be, where you have famine or you have widespread hunger. But there is something very profound about the way hunger is spoken about in the Qur'an and the Sunnah. Because you have to understand that the generation of the Prophet wasallam, the companions, all experienced a hunger that probably no one in this room has ever experienced. There is a type of hunger where your stomach growls. There's a type of hunger where you desire you know, something quickly or you feel dehydrated. And there's a type of hunger that actually starts to mess with your mind, that actually causes you hallucination, that actually becomes life-threatening. And I want you to appreciate that the generation of the Prophet Sallallahu experienced that type of jur, that type of hunger. And so when you, when you think of the Qur'an and the Sunnah through their ears, through their hearts, when they heard the word jur, hunger, it meant something to them that was totally different. Now, of course, there is an added layer of cruelty when hunger is used as a form of collective punishment. And in the modern uh, day, in 1977, it was an addendum to the Geneva Convention. It is a war crime. And the United Nations, which is probably one of, unfortunately, the most ineffective bodies on earth, but they did pass a resolution in 2018 calling this also a war crime. And today you may have seen the news that Human Rights Watch uh, accuses Israel of using starvation as a tactic which is a war crime. So I want to talk about it inshallah ta'ala uh, from this lens. Number one, in the Quran, Allah Azza wa Jal connected very, you know, subhanAllah, poetically and in a powerful manner, fear and hunger. We will test you with something of fear and in hunger. So there's a connection between fear and hunger, safety and food security, right? Allah Azza wa Jal also when he talks to Quraysh and he reminds them of his favors upon them, فَلْيَعْبُدُوا رَبَّ هَذَا الْبَيْتِ الَّذِي أَطْعَمَهُمْ مِنْ جُوعٍ وَآمَنَهُمْ مِنْ خَوْفٍ Right? Let them worship the Lord of this house who fed them when they were hungry and gave them security when they were afraid. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He speaks to us specifically about the types of charitable endeavors that we undertake, there is a, a visible manifestation of this, that they feed people from their food, despite their love for it. The implication of that, by the way, is that you are hungry, and you are giving of your food physically to someone that is next to you. And of the stories that are coming from the people of Gaza and from these places, subhanAllah, are some of the stories that you find from the Prophet wasallam, where he encouraged the Ansar. And he, in his miracle wasallam, one of his most prevalent miracles was his ability to take one pot of food or a pitcher of milk and from it, there would be a flow of food or a flow of milk to encourage people to turn a meal for two into a meal for three, a meal for three into a meal for six, and so on and so forth. There are multiple narrations in that regard. So think about you know, a person right now who gets a loaf of bread, or that mother 
subhanAllah, who we hear about in the seerah that Aisha radiallahu anha mentioned, that came to Aisha asking for food and Aisha radiallahu anha only had three dates to give to our mother, uh, to give to that woman. And when she gave that woman the three dates, that woman of course gave one date to each of her children and she herself, as she was about to eat her date, her two children cried for it and she took that date and cut it into two pieces and gave it to her two children and the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that this saved her from the fire. Protect yourself from the fire even with half a date. How many women in Gaza do you think lived this hadith in the last two months? Right? This very particular incident that we have. Now when we look at the hunger of the Prophet ﷺ and the companions, it is of course the case, before we get into the specific incidents where hunger was used against them, it is the case that the Prophet ﷺ was the hungriest man amongst the companions. He was the hungriest person amongst them. And of the signs of hunger that you'll start to see from the companions, extreme hunger. You have the hadith of Miqdad radiallahu ta'ala anhu who says, أَقْبَلْتُ أَنَا وَصَاحِبَانِ لِي وَقَدْ ذَهَبَتْ أَسْمَاعُنَا وَأَبُصَارُنَا مِنَ الْجَهْلِ that we came to the Prophet ﷺ, I and two companions, and we had lost our vision and our hearing from hunger. Or the hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu, where he says that there were days that I was so hungry, I can remember passing out between the Prophet ﷺ's manbar and the Prophet ﷺ's home. What we know as the rawda, subhanAllah, it is a garden of Jannah, and he remembered passing out. And he said, and I could remember someone coming to me and putting his foot, thinking that I was a madman, thinking that I had lost my mind, not realizing that it was nothing but hunger that caused me to collapse. This was the type of hunger that the best generation had ever faced and the best person, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now I want to give you another perspective here with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know how we get cranky when we're hungry? when we start to become bothered more easily, we become irritated on a day of fasting once it hits the last two hours of the fast. Imagine the Prophet ﷺ not eating for days, days. Now think about all the shama'il of the Prophet ﷺ. Think about all the attributes of the Prophet ﷺ. His smile, his laughter, his courtesy, his kindness, his compassion, his empathy والسلام, his just presence. You know, when you're hungry, you can't even be present in the gathering. The presence of the Prophet ﷺ, his body language towards people, his eyes looking at you, his ears listening attentively. And think about how much more of a miracle it is when you put that in the context of his extreme hunger ﷺ. And that's why when Allah ﷺ mentions that there are people, تَحْسَبُهُمْ agniya, you would think that they are wealthy or you think that they're just fine because of the way that they carry themselves, most people did not notice the hunger of the Prophet ﷺ because despite being the hungriest person amongst them, he acted like the fullest amongst them. You understand that concept? He manifests that ayah in the best of ways wasallam. He was the hungriest of the companions, but at the same time, he didn't show it in his behavior. And that's why the central focus of Medina was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but there is the hadith of him going out at night and Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu finding the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wandering around at night and Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was brought out by hunger and he asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam what he was doing out at night and he says, nothing brought you out except what brought me out. The focal point of Medina was Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but not a soul could tell how hungry he was. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So you know the types of people that you're seeing right now and look at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Abu Talha radiallahu anhu mentioned hearing it in his voice. So the closer you got to him, the more of a muhib, the more of someone who loved the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam you became, the more you started to recognize the signs. So Abu Talha radiallahu anhu, the stepfather of Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu, when he comes to his wife Umm Sulaim radiallahu anha and says, I heard the voice of the Prophet ﷺ and it sounded different. I heard the hunger in his voice. Or Jabir radiallahu ta'ala anhu noticing the bloating of the Prophet ﷺ, the bloating of a hungry person. When the Prophet ﷺ was malnourished and his stomach 
was poking out in a way that it did not before, not because it was full, but because it was empty, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the signs were present. And the ahadith are so many in one minute. You just run through them. What Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha says, his wife, ma shabi'a al Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, mundu qadim al Madina min ta'amin, burrin, thalatha layalin, tiba'in, hatta qubil, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That the family of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not eat their fill of bread for three successive days since the day that he migrated to Medina to the time that he died. Now we know that the persecution period was when? The first half of the seerah. But his hunger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was most pronounced when he was most powerful, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Anas radiallahu ta'ala anhu mentions the same, that I never saw the Prophet sallallahu eat a fine meal. He never had a properly baked piece of bread until he died. Aisha radiallahu anha would cry at the sight of a good meal and saying the Prophet sallallahu never got this. He never got this. And she says, كَانَ يَأْتِي عَلَيْنَا الشَّهْرُ مَا نُوْقِدُ فِيهِ نَارًا That a whole month would pass and we would not light a fire in the house of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. إِنَّمَا هُوَ تَمْرُ وَالْمَا All we could suffice ourselves with was a few dates and some water. And there are multiple narrations in this regard. I won't spend too much time. One more narration, subhanAllah, from Umar radiallahu anhu because you start to notice who noticed. Who noticed? Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu says, يَلْتَوِي فِي الْيَوْمِ مِنَ الْجُوعِ مَا يَجِدُ مِنَ الدَّقَلِ مَا يَمْلَأُ بِهِ بَطْنَهُ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمُ But the Prophet ﷺ would be in pain for the whole day and he couldn't find, what this hadith is referring to are the rotten dates, the worst of the dates. You know, the part of the, the batch that's the worst part that some would cast aside, that the Prophet ﷺ would spend a day and you could see that it was affecting him if you were paying attention to him alayhi salatu wasalam to the point that he couldn't even find some of the uh, the worst of the dates to put in his stomach sallallahu alayhi wasalam so this is our messenger alayhi salatu wasalam and this makes his character that much more inspiring and i want you to appreciate the people of Gaza, as you are seeing, their inspiring character, their ability to say what they're saying, their ability to be steadfast, all of that is not just while the airstrikes are falling upon them, but for most of them, they are not finding a loaf of bread or a proper sip of water. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them and may Allah azza wa jal increase them in every single way. Allahumma ameen. But that's another reason for us to take inspiration from them because of the jur, the type of hunger that they are facing, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, elevate them, Allahumma ameen. Now, in terms of using hunger against the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa and against the early Muslims, they faced this most prominently in two situations. The first time is in Mecca, and subhanAllah, you read the timeline, and it also relates to our day and age. The boycott of Banu Hashim and Banu Muttalib was for three years. And the Meccans decided to use this as a tactic to kill off the Prophet ﷺ and his companions or to get them to buckle in hunger and renounce the message in hunger because they thought it was the least messy way to kill them or to get them to renounce their faith. Psychological warfare, right? It's a crime then and it's a crime now. The idea was if we cut off their food and drink for long enough, and the Prophet ﷺ hears the children crying at nights, and the mothers become unable to breastfeed their children, and they cannot even take care of their animals, then eventually one of two things will happen. Some of them will die, and some of them will renounce their faith. And there is no blood on the scene. This is what makes it such an evil tactic. When did they choose to boycott the Prophet ﷺ and his companions? Can anybody tell me what was the, the incident that came right before that incident? Because it is very significant. What was the incident that came right before that incident? When do you think the Muslims had their highest morale in Mecca? What is a day that you can think of that the Muslims had their highest morale? Raise your hand so I can actually get, yeah. Isra and Mi'raj is afterwards, so it's after the boycott. So prior to the boycott, when do you think the Muslims had their highest day of morale? There weren't many of them. Yeah. The day Umar radiallahu anhu accepted Islam. The day Umar radiallahu anhu accepted Islam 
the Muslims came out in Mecca and they marched for the first time, publicly declaring their faith, unafraid, right? The first time the Muslims could be present, that was a morale boost. The first time the Muslims could walk together and say, La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, that was a morale boost. The boycott happened literally a few days after that because they wanted to break their spirit. SubhanAllah, it's so much more significant when you think about that. Their morale was high and there is no way to break a people's spirit like hunger, where they start to act out of character, right? And they start to show not signs of strength, but signs of weakness. They wanted to break the spirit of the Muslims because after Umar anhu, they became the most threatening because of their resilience. The beatings didn't work, the persecution didn't work, we've got to try something else, their spirit is high. And so the incident comes right after the Islam of Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And subhanAllah, it's as if you're, you're thinking about Qita' Gaza, the, the Gaza Strip, where did they put them? In Shi'ib, Abi Talib, in a single valley where they could be encompassed from every direction. What was the logic of that? Abu Jahl wanted to ensure that there was no route for food or drink to reach them, not from in front or behind or from the right and the left. Shut them off from all directions and threaten the people from trading with them or from taking anything to them. Isolate them entirely from their extended tribesmen, from every single outsider and insider. Cut them off. And so they were in Sha'ib Abi Talib. And by the way, physically, I've actually been to Sha'ib Abi Talib. Obviously now it's like another neighborhood, right? But you think about it and you say, SubhanAllah, the geography of Mecca, which obviously is going away with the buildings and things of that sort, the flattening of mountains, but the geography of it. There's something incredibly demoralizing about being stuck in a valley this way for three whole years. And the main tool against them was hunger, starving them. And the Prophet Sallallahu would hear the moaning at night of children and people of old age and more so than anything else in his own household Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as Khadija Radiallahu Ta'ala Anha, the most noble person, the most noble of women was forced to eat leaves and Khadija Radiallahu Anha herself would eventually succumb to the health consequences of that boycott. So she would die shortly after that boycott and as many scholars say, as a result of the malnutrition on her body because she was older radiallahu ta'ala anha and this was harder for her to bear and she would pass away as a result of it radiallahu ta'ala anha. Of course Abu Talib as well within just a few days of Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. For three years they were in this concentration camp. For three years they were cut off from everyone. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu ta'ala anhu he gives you the story that tells you how hungry they were. He said, I went out one night to urinate, to use the bathroom, to relieve myself. And he said, I was so hungry and as I was urinating, I realized that my urine, and this is a very vivid narration, he said it was hitting a harder surface, and then I saw what it was hitting and I realized it was a dried camel skin. He said, I took it and he said, I cleaned it off and I crushed it and I stirred it and I turned it into my food for three days. Sa'id ibn Abi Waqqas, who greater than... This, this man is one of Ashar Mubashirin al Jannah, one of the ten people promised paradise. And this was the test. He's remembering. That's how bad it got for us that we had to crush things that were not even edible and turn them into food for ourselves until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala relieved us of that pain. Now, what is the punishment? of those who inflict hunger. Pay attention to a narration that you've all heard. Hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma, where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, عُذِّبَتْ امْرَأَةٌ فِي هِرَّةٌ أَمْسَكَتْهَا حَتَّى مَاتَتْ مِنَ الْجُوعِ That a woman was thrown into hellfire because of a cat. What did she specifically do? She held that cat away from food. فَلَمْ تَكُنْ تُطْعِمُهَا so she would not feed the cat herself. وَلَا تُرْسِلُهَا فَتَأْكُلْ مِنْ خَشَاشِ الْأَرْضِ 
and she would not let the cat go to eat on its own from whatever it could find roaming the earth. So subhanAllah, the crime of this woman that earned her hellfire was prohibiting a cat from food, I mean, you know, forcing upon it al jur. There's another narration about the same woman that's even more vivid. It's a narration of Asma' bint Abi Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anha wa an abiha. She says that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Danat minni now, that hellfire was brought close to me. Hatta qultu ay rab wa ana ma'ahum until I said, Ya Allah, am I to be of its inhabitants? It's being brought so closely. And the one person the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw in this incident, fa'idha imra'atun hasibtu annahu qal, Takhdishuha hirra. Asma radiallahu anha saying, so the Prophet said, I saw a woman, and I think it's as if he said that a cat was scratching her. SubhanAllah, look at the payback, look at the revenge, look at how Allah Azza wa takes revenge on this woman. The cat scratching her, and she is in hellfire. And the Prophet said, Ay Rabbi, ma sha'nu Oh my Lord, what is it with this woman? What is it with this woman? And the Prophet ﷺ was told that this was a woman that took a cat and prevented it from food until it died, hatta matat, ju'an, until it died out of hunger. If this is the case, of course, of doing so to a cat, what of the case of people who do this to human beings? What about those who do this to believers? What about those who do this to the best people on earth? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wa ma kana rabbuka nasiyya. And of course, the second time was the Khandaq, where for a month they ran out of their food supplies in Medina as they were behind the trench. And this is where the Prophet's hunger was most described, where it was most pronounced, وسلم, because the Prophet وسلم, did not eat even as the companions. And this was a mindset, by the way, that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, taught in terms of leadership. Abu Talha radiallahu ta'ala anhu says about that time, Shakawna ila Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam al jur that we complained to the Prophet وسلم, that day of our hunger. And he says, Warafa'na an butunina an hajar. And we exposed our stomachs and we showed the Prophet وسلم, that we had stones tied to our stomach. Farafa'a Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam an batnihi an hajarain. So the Prophet وسلم, exposed his stomach and he had two stones, alayhi salatu was salam tied to his stomach because his hunger was the most severe sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and this was of course the mindset that then is transported to Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu in the most difficult moments of the famine where the house of Umar was the home in which there was the least food as people were dying from hunger but because of his strength he somehow managed to survive that difficult famine radiallahu ta'ala anhu last thing I'll leave you with inshallah ta'ala in this regard are the du'as that we learn from the Prophet وسلم, about hunger to give us that perspective. And of course, we make these du'as for our brothers and sisters as well. And we take the lesson of what these du'as actually imply. The first of them, by the way, is not specific to hunger, but it is about poverty. And what poverty can drive people to, good people to. What poverty can drive good people to do. And that is the du'a that you say every single morning and every single evening. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-kufri wal-faqr wa a'udhu bika min adhab al-qabr. O oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from disbelief and poverty. Min al-kufri wal-faqr wa a'udhu bika min adhab al-qabr. And I seek refuge in you from the punishment of the grave. The Prophet ﷺ tying kufr and faqr, disbelief and poverty. And Imam al-Nawi rahimahullah and Ibn Hajar rahimahullah, they have Powerful commentaries on this. Of them is that the Prophet ﷺ put kufr and faqr in the same station to show that just as you are seeking to remove disbelief from the earth, you should have that same seriousness in eradicating poverty. So putting kufr in the same category of al-faqr, that's number one. Number two, that it sometimes could be that al-faqr could lead to kufr. That poverty could lead a person to disbelief if it becomes severe enough, which is why we should have a spiritual imperative to not let people get to that breaking point in their lives. Do not let people get to that breaking point in their lives when you have the opportunity. You're not just saving their bodies, you could also be saving their souls, so it doesn't become a fitna for them if they struggle with poverty too much. But then I want to leave you, subhanAllah, with the specific du'a of the Prophet ﷺ against al-jur, because it's, it's very powerful. 
And it's actually a chapter in, uh, in some of the books of Hadith, Baba Ta'awud min al uh, the, the chapter of seeking refuge from hunger. You'll find it in Ibn Majah, you'll find it in Sunan Nasa'i, that this is actually a chapter. And there's a narration, and, and none other than Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu who would narrate this, the hungriest companion of the Prophet sallallahu would know a dua that he heard from the Prophet sallallahu against hunger. He said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, kana sallallahu the Prophet used to say, what do, you impl- what do you take from that implication from a hadith? He used to say means that it was a frequent dua of his sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He used to say, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al jur Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al jur Now by the way, some of us are thinking, that's not a possibility for us. Many hungry people thought like you one day. Right? They thought hunger would never... You know, yeah, we can just go to the grocery store. We can order. We don't think of that as a possibility for us. But many hungry people never thought that they would find themselves in this situation. And so even making this dua now when you have no fear of hunger is actually a good dua, by the way. It's actually a good dua to make. Okay? So you learn this dua, inshallah ta'ala, and you think about its implications. قَالَ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ اللَّهُمَ إِنِّي أَعُوذُ بِكَ مِنَ الْجُوعِ فَإِنَّهُ بِئْسَ الضَّجِيعِ O oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from hunger because it is the worst of companions. It's the worst companion to have is the companion of hunger. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-ju'r fa'innahu bi'sa al-dajir wa a'udhu bika min al-khiyana fa'innaha bi'sa al-bitana And he said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and I seek refuge in you, O oh Allah, from being treacherous, from being one who betrays because that is the worst thing to hide inside of your heart. SubhanAllah, this dua, like every other dua of the Prophet has a heavy implication. The worst thing you can put, the worst thing you can have in terms of the physical state is that you, you have an empty stomach. And the worst thing you can fill your heart with is treachery, al khiyan The worst situation you could have with your stomach is that there is nothing to put inside of it. And the worst thing you could conceal inside of you is al khiyana is treachery. And of course, many people, and this is a sad reality, people become treacherous or they start to um, inculcate corrupt practices sometimes out of hunger, out of the necessity of hunger. Some people steal out of hunger. There's the whole lesson that we have from Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu in lifting the head lifting the punishment of theft in a time where some people were indeed stealing out of hunger that doesn't reduce the severity of the sin. It's just a reality. And Allah Azza wa understands who He created and how He created us. So the Prophet Sallallahu feared more than physical poverty, spiritual poverty. And He taught us to have that mindset as well, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so the dua, once again, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-ju'r. Let's say it together, inshaAllah. Allahumma. إِنِّي أَعُوذُ بِكَ مِنَ الْجُوعِ فَإِنَّهُ بِئْسَ الضَّجِيعِ وَأَعُوذُ بِكَ مِنَ الْخِيَانَةِ فَإِنَّهَا بِئْسَ الْبِطَانَةِ O oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from hunger, for it is the worst of companions, and I seek refuge in you from treachery, for it is the worst thing to conceal in our hearts. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from hunger and its effects. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from poverty and its effects. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect our brothers and sisters in Gaza. May He preserve their spirits, may He preserve their bodies, and our hungry brothers and sisters all over the world. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala nourish their bodies and nourish their souls, continue to allow them to be inspired and inspiring. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevate them in this life and the next Allahumma ameen aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam barak ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in wa assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh